All right, yeah, welcome to uh, this afternoon's session about nightmares of a container orchestration system. Uh, so it will be about stuff you shouldn't do to your cluster or you should do to your cluster uh, if you really want to break it. Maybe just a short raise of hands, uh, given your experience level, who is operating some kind of container orchestration, Kubernetes, DCOS in production? Okay, how many of that is Kubernetes? Just curious. Oh, okay, a fair distribution. Um, so I try to keep it general. Uh, so most of this should actually apply to any container system you're running. I also I try to keep the level. I picked some more advanced topics. I picked some basic topics. So I hope I can have something new for everyone in here. Me, that's Jörg Schad. I'm a distributed systems engineer uh, with Mesosphere in San Francisco. So uh, also I just arrived last night. Everything where I talk crap or anything is unclear, this is due to jet lag. Um, and me virtually joining in this presentation, so unfortunately he cannot be here in person, is Jan. So Jan is one of our support engineers or SAs, so he will guide us through this presentation as you'll see because he is actually the person in support who has to deal with a lot of weird calls and a lot of weird situations. So this is basically taken from his repertoire and kind of a best of. So best of is basically at 3 a.m. in the morning when all containers are failing over and uh, this is what Jan really tries to avoid. Uh, Jan's background. Jan's background is actually based on DCOS, so the data center operating system, so the container orchestrator being built around Mesos, uh, which can also do um, big data like Spark, Kafka, Cassandra, and all these things running on top. But I said this is going to be the only slide about DCOS here. So, uh, container orchestration. Uh, I hope we are all aware of container orchestration. What I still see from time to time is people who are actually going out there and they write their own scripts. So, we deploy all, all our containers with own scripts. And I personally, I don't really care which container orchestrator you're using, but I really would urge you not, don't write that yourself. It's really, really tough. And just keeping all of that together, considering all the different failover cases, uh, is something really challenging. And what are those different challenges? So if we look at um, the typical runtime, if we wouldn't um, use some kind of container orchestration, then basically our stack is going to look like that. We have some kind of container runtime, um, and then we just deploy our services on top. And this is actually how Twitter looked uh, a while back, and when Twitter had this fail whale interactions. So this was mainly also, or partially also caused to just them having not an orchestrator. So what they did, they would meet every Friday, and they would basically count how many of the app containers were still running. So if they had a count, there were supposed to be 100 running, and on Friday they would see that there are only, I don't know, 75 running, they would have to go in and restart 25 uh, of those containers. And this obviously is nothing sustainable and nothing we should strive for. So this is actually why we want container orchestration. And container orchestration is covering like those three broad topic areas. So first of all, it's scheduling. And scheduling includes uh, the scenario we just mentioned where a container fails over and someone has to go in and restart that. And hopefully that's not an operator, but hopefully this is the container orchestration system. Furthermore, it should support scaling. So scaling either Automatically, which is a bit difficult, so whenever a container orchestration system tells me it will scale automatically in all directions, this is usually fine for stateless containers, but as soon as I'm uh, deploying stateful containers, I should be rather careful and I would only rely on the own logic I'm writing to actually scale down. Scaling down is the hard part here, my stateful containers. Other things uh, you should look out for when choosing your container orchestrator or when deploying your container orchestrator is uh, the upgrade story. So first of all, upgrades first of, for the containers I'm running. So I should be able to have some kind of upgrade schemes, some kind of rolling upgrades, blue-green deployments, canary deployments, that I can actually always keep my uh, users happy while they're uh, using my platform, even though I have to deploy the next version of my container. 
And what we should also keep in mind that <coughs> this platform itself, uh, whatever container orchestrator we are using, <coughs> we also have to upgrade that from time to time. Uh, the next point is resource management. So um, what a container orchestrator will do for us, it will actually manage all the resources in our cluster. And uh, so it will isolate GPU, CPU, and uh, is responsible for keeping those pieces apart. And this is something, for example, if I'm considering to run machine learning workloads, then I should also look at GPU isolation, where it's a different support by different container orchestrators. And in my opinion, the hardest and most helpful part about container orchestration is service management. So service management is about we don't only deploy a single container. Usually we deploy hundreds to several thousands of them. And so we need a way of forming services out of them and connect, connecting them. And that then includes load balancing, health checks, readiness checks. Um, so uh, it allows us to actually view that as a service and not view it as individual containers. All right, and by that, our stack will look like this. We have some container runtime, then we have our container orchestration layer, and this can be Kubernetes, this can be uh, Swarm, it has to be, and uh, it can also be DCS, Marathon. Uh, I've seen some people using Nomad as well, so by now you actually have a lot of choices at this layer. And as I said, the important part is just don't implement that yourself. Um, next important thing is actually backup state. So um, even though those systems they are highly fault tolerant, there can always be some issue where it's actually failing over. And this can be um, missing uh, operator configuration or operator configuration gone wrong. Uh, this can be total outage of multiple data centers. Uh, we shouldn't, you shouldn't rely on anything uh, being stable, especially if you're in the cloud. And so what should you back up? So by the way, this is Jan, and Jan right now is frustrated if we don't have a backup. So what should we back up in order to not make Jan frustrated? Uh, this first of all is the cluster state. So uh, we should be able to respawn our cluster even though everything has failed. And so for example, this can be Zookeeper at CD state. Um, and furthermore, it should be all of our configuration files for our cluster. So we shouldn't have anything, and you'll see that through the rest, remainder of the presentation, we shouldn't have anything hard-coded uh, by UI or some other uh, uh, usage which we cannot reproduce from a Git repo or some other kind of means. And the second thing we should update is for all stateful services, uh, we should also update, uh, uh, back up the state. So in case of failover, nothing is lost. Networking. Networking, especially if we deploy a lot of containers, becomes a totally different challenge compared to those times when we were just uh, deploying VMs. VMs, we had a few endpoints, but if we look at a typical or uh, this is just a sample uh, cluster where we see which t services is talking to which service. We see that a lot of interaction is uh, all of a sudden happening inside the cluster. Especially if we go to microservices, we have a lot of small services which all need talk to talk to each other. So uh, all of a sudden inside the cluster, uh, we have a lot more challenges uh, to solve. And these three basic challenges are connectivity. So services, they have to be able to talk to each other. Uh, load balancing, because I might usually have multiple backends and I need some kind of load balancing mechanism between them. Um, and then uh, service discovery. So how can, where can they find uh, the other service uh, without knowing on which physical host it's running? Um, another thing which is, uh, connected to is uh, which is connected to connectivity is isolation. Often we also want to explicitly disallow services talking to each other. Uh, for security reasons that, for example, hopefully your test environment is disjoint from your production environment, but if you have, for example, a multi-tenant setup, you usually you want to avoid different tenants talking to each other. Um, there are different solutions to that. Um, I see a lot of people using Istio right now, for example. Who of you is using Istio or has heard of Istio so far? 
No one? Okay. So this is a service mesh uh, being built um, mostly uh, on Kubernetes, but it's currently also supported on top of Mesos. And that actually tries to solve this networking problem by running a sidecar container next to each application container. Uh, sorry, I expected uh, more people to know that, otherwise I would have thrown in a slide for that. So basically imagine... Uh, this is your application container, and then next to it you're running uh, a load balancer container, and all network traffic is going through that container. Uh, and that actually gives um, the control plane, which is Istio then, a chance to configure all of that. So it's easy to configure all those load balancers, all those sidecars, to uh, allow for authentication, to allow for who is allowed to talk to whom, so connectivity, uh, and also for load balancing and service discovery. So basically, uh, the trend is to keep all of this out of your application uh, and move it into like a central instance. Um, imagine just the problem of retrying. Um, each service, you have maybe services in three different languages, and all of a sudden now you have to re-implement the retry, what happens if the other side doesn't answer, you have to re-implement that in three different languages. When you're using the sidecar approach, you can actually just configure the sidecar uh, consistently across all services, and you don't care which implementation language is chosen by each service. And that makes it a whole lot easier. Um, I don't believe Istio is solving all problems, so the centralized approach uh, also has downsides if you actually need application-specific control uh, over there, but then you can still just go around Istio uh, in that pattern. Uh, the other thing you should consider uh, when networking is, uh, and especially load balancing, is at which layer do you actually need to load balance? Uh, do you need to load balance on layer uh, 7 or on layer 4? So those are the two big uh, kinds of load balancers which are out there. And so the difference is like at layer four, it's basically just package uh, load balancing or package routing. Whereas on layer seven, I have more advanced features. So for example, I can keep track of sessions. I can allow uh, authentication uh, for uh, sessions and streams. So uh, I have more features available. But on the other hand, it's also more expensive because actually uh, the uh, load balancer has to touch and read all packages, whereas for a layer four load balancer, it just has to forward it. So this is kind of like an important decision. Uh, usually uh, in most production clusters, I see the need for both. Uh, but if you can avoid it, I would try to stick to layer four because it's simply more scalable. And this is, in my opinion, another downside of Istio that by default it comes with the Envoy uh, load balancer and this is actually bringing up all your packages from kernel space into user space and hence this is a huge performance hit uh, on your network uh, performance. Any questions to that? I said I'm sorry I didn't come up with a slide for Istio because I'm used to uh, most people having seen that. Okay. Next thing, uh, immutable container images. So in this image, uh, it's basically it's just saying we want to use the Ubuntu image. And I would really try not to do that because what that usually means is uh, implicitly that we will use Ubuntu latest. And Ubuntu latest will change over time. And now imagine you have your 100 containers running on your platform and uh, one of them fails, it gets restarted, it pulls Ubuntu latest, which by now, I would guess 17.10 or something like that. And so you have 99 containers running your previous version, 16 something, and one of those containers running 17.10. Uh, and this will make debugging hell, uh, and uh, it's not fun. So you should only use tagged images, and if you control those images yourself, you also you shouldn't override tags. In theory, if you, have, if you create your own containers, you can override even those tagged images, but you should really just keep them as unmutable um, in your registry because this will make your entire setup and debugging, monitoring a whole lot easier. Um, in a similar direction is actually uh, private container registries. If you're running a production cluster, Whenever possible, uh, try to pull your own private registry into the container. If you're running on Google Cloud, Amazon or so, 
it can be okay to use their container registries, but in general, you want to have that container registry under your control because that also makes this immutability problem easier because you actually control what's being pushed to that registry and you have it much closer to your cluster so you incur much uh, less network traffic. Uh, and repeatable container builds. Any container which is being thrown onto your production cluster should come out of a, a Docker file. Um, so for testing, this Docker commit, so Docker commit, what it allows me to do, I can go in a container and actually commit whatever I've changed to so commit the latest file system layer. But uh, in practice, this will uh, lead to problems because you cannot really rebuild your container. So each container you're deploying in a production system should be repeatedly buildable from some kind of version Docker file, uh, which is part of the infrastructure as code uh, you're using. Um, Exactly, and um, repeatable builds, uh, this should uh, include the uh, from clause. So even in the from clause, you should make sure that you're not pulling, for example, from Ubuntu latest because that might change, and hence your repeatable build uh, might change uh, in the part before where, where you're getting something from. Uh, also, in general, try to keep images uh, minimal. So multi-stage builds are really your friends there if you need a large um, environment for building your containers. So if you need to pull in all C++, uh, the entire build tool chain, usually you don't want to have that in your final container and uh, only in the container you actually need to build it. And I think you also showed that this morning in your uh, tutorial, right? Multi-stage. And uh, from scratch is another great thing to just keep uh, dependencies and also the sizes uh, minimal. And of course it also reduces the attack surface uh, because we don't have any unnecessary libraries in there. Uh, UI deployments. So UI deployments, I sometimes do that if I give a demo, there's a nice UI and I can simply click, copy, paste something there. But in production this should never happen. Uh, in production you should only uh, go there via some kind of endpoints. And this should actually be also versioned app definitions. And at best they come from some kind of CI CD setup. And it's, um, most production clusters uh, we set up, we say everything which gets deployed to the production cluster should have gone through the CICD platform because that implicitly ensures that you can always rebuild or it makes it easier <laughs> to ensure that you can always rebuild the current cluster state. Disk usage. So uh, this brings us into the area now something is running and uh, this brings us into the area of monitoring. And monitoring is crucial to keeping up a cluster up and running. And so one typical problem we saw in early years when people started uh, using containers were full disk images. So Docker and Logs, they are both really great in filling up uh, your disk space. So with Docker, it's your images, uh, your running images which are being kept around if you don't specify minus minus RM. Um, and also the containers are being kept around. So you should have a way and a specified way to clean up your Docker instances and uh, images from your cluster. So Docker prune or what I like to use is from Spotify, there's the Docker garbage collection which actually removes them uh, based on certain conditions, which is rather helpful. And most importantly, just monitor your disk space so you actually you get informed before you run out of disk space. So there should be an alert before your disk uh, gets you in a state which is unusable. Uh, resource constraints. Uh, all container schedulers uh, or orchestration systems allow you to specify how many resources you want to uh, attach or allocate to your container. And this is really an art of doing that. So with this, this is like a sample image where uh, we specify 32 megabyte, and 32 megabytes, they prob this probably won't be sufficient for running a full Docker container. So most likely this will uh, run OOM and will be killed by the C group's uh, OOM killer. Um, 
On the other hand, choosing it to 32 gigabytes is probably also way too much. So you need some way in between um, of having a healthy relationship. So um, again, there, this is an area where really monitoring can be helpful. So uh, one typical uh, metric I would monitor in any cluster is this resource slack, we call it. So this is the difference between the actual resource consumption and the maximum limit you have allocated uh, to those containers. So in this case, it would be the resource usage, uh, or it would be 32 megabytes minus the resource usage, which uh, probably won't stay positive for a long time. So as said, it's difficult to approximate uh, especially for Java people. I've seen a lot of Java people, if they start out, they specify the heap space. And actually, Java 9 does it by default. We'll see that in a bit. Um, and just specifying the heap space might not be enough because as actually with Java, there's a lot of overhead around. Uh, Zookeeper or any quorum cluster size, uh, it should be uh, odd, an odd number. I hope uh, everyone is aware of that because that just makes quorum decisions a whole lot easier. And uh, the second factor is then, the second question we usually get asked is how many nodes should we use? So three nodes, uh, this actually gives me a fault tolerance of one. So one node can fail and my quorum will still be uh, responsive. But there's actually one situation in the lifetime of a cluster where I already take one node out, and this is doing upgrades. So doing, when I upgrade my cluster, I already take one node out, I upgrade that, and then I throw it back into the quorum. So during the time of an upgrade, I already have reduced uh, the number of nodes by one. So if I only have three nodes, this would actually be, uh, give me, get me in a situation where when one other node fails doing an upgrade, I actually my cluster will become unresponsive. So in production clusters, I would usually recommend uh, using five. Uh, on the other hand, uh, throwing more and more nodes in there also isn't helpful because your distributed write will become more expensive. So a quorum really becomes uh, much less performant uh, the more nodes you add. Health checks. Uh, health checks are your indicator to the container orchestrator what's running healthy and what uh, should be restarted. So they actually they have a lot of implications uh, onto the system. So for example, also load balancers uh, consider health checks uh, in deciding where to route traffic to. So if your health check of your application says I'm not healthy, First, the container orchestrator will stop uh, routing traffic there if it's integrated with the load balancer. And on the other hand, uh, if that remains for a while, it will actually go in and kill that container uh, by hoping that the newly started container, so it kills one, and then one will be restarted, uh, a new instance of that container image. And that actually uh, has the hope that the newly started image will become healthy again. So they have a lot of implications on your cluster health uh, and also performance if you choose them in a way that it always restarts. So if you have a badly chosen health check which uh, remains unhealthy for non-justified reasons. Uh, in Mesos you actually, or in DCS you have multiple uh, kinds of health checks you can specify. And I believe the biggest distinction is the question whether you want to use Mesos or Marathon health checks. And the distinction is that Marathon health checks, they are run from central nodes. They are run from the master nodes because this is where the Marathon master is running. And the Marathon master will try to ping that uh, container and invoke the health check. Uh, on the other hand, the Mesos health check is doing that locally from the agent. So there's the Mesos agent itself on each node will ping that container and see if it's healthy. Both have advantages and disadvantages. So the big advantage of the Marathon health check is that I actually know that my container is reachable from the outside, from another node in the cluster. On the other hand, this will actually become a performance bottleneck because I have those individual nodes all pinging, all trying to 
potentially reach all uh, containers in my large cluster. So it's not very scalable. On the other hand, Mesos Health Checks, they're very scalable because they are run from each node locally. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't necessarily know whether my service is also reachable from other nodes in the cluster. Uh, no SQL data stores, uh, and I believe this goes under the general direction or the heading could also be understand the underlying technology. So what I've seen with some customers is that they actually went in, they ripped out their Postgres instances and replaced them all with Cassandra instances because some database vendor told them this is a great idea. It might in some cases be a good idea. Just in general, you should be aware of uh, the implementation and performance implications of the data store you're using. So Cassandra is not really a, a relational database. It's actually, it's like a columnar store database. And it also has different consistency guarantees. So if I take my data model, which I've successfully and in a high performance setup run on Postgres and throw that one to one onto Cassandra, it most likely will have pretty bad performance. And I might even get stale results. So uh, I should really look at the underlying uh, per performance uh, indicators of my data store and then also choose it uh, in a way uh, that it fits to my data model. Uh, removing stateful frameworks. Uh, so I believe over the last years there has been a lot of effort, uh, both in uh, DCS and Kubernetes, of automatically removing persistent resources or custom uh, resources. So there has been an entire garbage collection framework being written, for example, for Kubernetes. In general, if you remove something uh, which has some state, uh, just make sure that it's really fully removed and it uh, not leaves any leftovers in the cluster. Uh, containers versus VM. And again, this is uh, the general message, understand the underlying technology. So I hope all of us are aware that uh, virtual machines have different uh, isolation semantics uh, compared to uh, virtual machines, uh, containers, because all containers they are running on the same kernel. But that actually also has implications for the software for the containers I'm running on top. So this, first of, us, first of all, brings us to the question, what is actually a container? So containers can mean different things if you talk to different people. So first of all, there's a container runtime, which might be uh, Docker daemon. So that might be the thing actually starting up a, a container and controlling it. Uh, then there is a container image, which is, yeah, for example, the Ubuntu Docker image we've seen in the early app definition. And this is kind of the description of what we want to start. And then there's a container instance, which is the running uh, instance of some of those images uh, in our cluster. And all of those are actually different instances. And for all of those, I have different choices uh, if I'm trying to choose containers. So, for example, I don't even necessarily need a container image to run a container. So this is one app definition uh, being based uh, on a Marathon app definition for DCOS. And all I do is I simply say I want to run a Java application. And for Java applications, I only have two dependencies. So I have to pull some JRE into my container. And I have to put, pull in my jar, which I want to run. And I don't actually have to melt it all together into a container image. I can simply create this container on the fly. And uh, this can be beneficial. Um, for example, in the CICD pipeline, I don't always have to create those uh, Docker images. And uh, as we're just talking about Java applications um, and understand your underlying technology, uh, Java has this write once run anywhere uh, promise, and this is actually the same promise container give, give us. So um, unfortunately, this is not really the case uh, with Java or with also with .NET or uh, other technologies which look at the underlying uh, environment where they run. And this is mainly because Java before version 9 is not cgroups aware. And we'll see what that means in a second. And so it actually means for my Java applications, I should set my uh, parameters carefully. Um, because 
what happens is, uh, so here on the left, I actually have my VM image, and there everything is fine. So Java will start up, and Java will look at uh, the hypervisor, for example, how many uh, processors are available, how much memory is available, and use that to uh, set up a lot of the infrastructure. So for example, the default number of garbage collection threads, the default number of threads in the common fork joint pool, they are all being based on the number of cores available to that instance. If I'm now running inside a container, unfortunately, uh, the JVM previous uh, pre version 9 is not aware of that so what it'll do it'll ask the host and the host might actually have much more uh, processors available than I have assigned to my container so uh, to make it a concrete example I develop my Java application here on my laptop it all runs fine now I deploy that onto my production cluster. And on my production cluster, it's a large machine, it has 32 cores, so I can start more instances there, right? So I decide to start 10 of those uh, on that cluster. What it now means, as a Java is looking below, uh, always at the total number of cores, that uh, in total, each of those uh, will spin up 32 will see 32 cores, and each of my JVM containers will spin up 32 threads for the common fork join pool, will spin up 32 threads for the, um, uh, for the garbage collection, uh, and so on and so on. So it'll always kind of see uh, th uh, 320 cores because 10 JVM containers each seeing 32 of those, and so I might actually end up that my Java application is just thrashing uh, and just switching between different threads and cannot do any actual real work. Uh, with Java 9, this has actually become better. So with Java 9, uh, what happens, the JVM is aware if I set some experimental flags uh, for some JVM, uh, for some uh, C group settings. So what in Java 9 the JVM will do, it'll look at the C group settings and it'll see if I have specified CPU sets so uh, CPU sets means basically that I pin uh, certain cores to my container, which is not the typical way any container orchestration system is doing that. Typical way is that they use CPU shares. So I still have that problem. The other thing the JVM will do in Java version 9 is they'll look at the uh, amount of memory being assigned to my container. And this is what they'll use to automatically configure the heap space. So if I set uh, 2 gigabytes uh, as the C group limit, as the container limit, uh, to my JVM container, it'll automatically configure the heap space to be 2 gigabytes. This already helps quite a lot, just unfortunately there's a lot more memory consumption by the JVM besides the heap space. So for example, the entire NEO, so the uh, I.O. Uh, is living outside, threat management is living outside in different uh, memory space. There's the um, perm slash meta space uh, living outside the heap space. So just setting the heap space to that maximum number doesn't uh, resolve all issues of running out of memory because there's more memory consumption uh, outside the container. In practice, it actually helps quite a lot because from a certain level, from 80% uh, memory utilization of the heap, the garbage collector collection will become really uh, aggressive, and so it's unlikely that the heap will uh, reach 100%. Okay, we've seen that. Uh, Mesos modules, or in general, custom written modules. So Mesos allows me to specify my own modules, and Kubernetes allows me to do the same. Kubernetes, it's all communicating via uh, their uh, gRPC API, and in or HTTP uh, for some. And uh, so in Mesos, uh, it's it's similar. There are two different kinds of modules, but basically, always when I go into a cluster and I replace some uh, common logic, some default logic with my own logic, I really have to be have to do a lot of testing, and I have to be aware of uh, unwanted consequences to my cluster, because it usually involves a lot of things. So I've seen a cluster where they changed uh, some of the 
default scheduling uh, in Mesos, and that actually imp had implications for the monitoring and broke the monitoring uh, over two corners. So you should really make sure if you uh, ingest custom components or replace a default components that you do a lot of testing and adjust the entire ecosystem around uh, to this change, which usually is costly. Uh, Linux distributions, uh, so you should make sure or you should be aware that uh, there's a certain number of certain test budget available. So for example, uh, we have recommended uh, Linux distributions. It probably runs on others as well, but I would really stick to those which are being tested because uh, those recommended and tested ones, they also guarantee me that it will work in the future while it might break for some other distribution. Services on the same node. So container schedulers, they assume that they own the entire node if it comes to scheduling decisions. So if I'm running something outside uh, of this container orchestrator, so I'm deploying Cassandra outside uh, of my Kubernetes cluster. I deploy Kafka outside of my Mesos cluster. Then I have to make sure that I adjust the resource consumption and that I actually also isolate uh, this other workload running on the same nodes, uh, probably similarly as uh, the container orchestrator would isolate that workload from other workloads. Uh, spreading out master nodes. So this uh, concerns to running in like hybrid clouds or hybrid setups. And uh, for running in hybrid setups, there are some concerns. So the first stage usually is that people start out by spreading out nodes across different zones or across different clusters. So one common setup we're seeing is that people are using spot instances to simply get more compute power. And those spot instances, they might run in a different zone. They might even run in a different data center. Uh, so usually for those agents, for those worker nodes, it's not such a big problem. The problem uh, comes if I try to split up the quorum or the master nodes across high latency links because they have to communicate really quick because the quorum has to be in sync. So if I try, uh, start spreading out the masters, uh, probably trying different availability zones within one region usually is okay because the latency isn't too high. But uh, if I really start spreading them out across different regions in AWS or the respective term in whatever cloud or uh, own data center you're running in, um, it probably will become uh, more challenging and you should really monitor the latency in between. So it can also happen that it works fine for a while, but then there's a switching change, uh, some network cable is being cut in between those uh, two regions, and all of a sudden you have more latency and this might bring down your cluster. So this again is something you should monitor very carefully. Agent attributes or uh, kind of the metadata which might be used for scheduling decisions. Mesos allows you to set uh, those attributes and they can for example be used to specify that this node, so they are set on a per node level, and they can specify that this node right now is in REC ABC, in zone west, it has a CentOS operating system and so on and so on. And uh, this uh, attributes I can use when scheduling. So for example, a common thing is to say, spread out my containers across uh, all racks being available because I don't want everything to end up on one rack. If that rack fails, uh, all my containers would be lost. So a common thing is to say, kind of do round robin across the racks with all my containers. Uh, now it just becomes then, it impacts scheduling decisions if I go in and I change those attributes. In theory, I can do that to a certain degree, but just imagine I change the rack name, for example. This will impact uh, potentially even previous scheduling decisions, so it's something I should be very, very careful with uh, in doing so. Usually the better thing is to wait, and uh, once a container, uh, replace it with a new one. So bring down that agent and replace it with a new one where I set the new agent attributes. Cluster upgrades. Uh, cluster upgrades are a great thing, and uh, I should 
I should employ that, I should upgrade to new clusters, and we'll see a little bit more how that works in, on the next slide. But I should be aware that this is a pretty intrusive thing, doing a lot to my cluster. So most importantly, I should check the health before I upgrade. I see a lot of people, when they have issues with their cluster, they say, oh, okay, probably the next version is going to have that solved. So they have a broken cluster, and then they start to upgrade, which usually is not a great idea. Uh, so uh, also follow the upgrade instructions. Uh, it, for all container orchestrators, this has become a whole lot easier and simpler to upgrade, but they're still often in the instructions, they tell you where are things which are not compatible. And read that before and see whether that applies to your system. So for example, some endpoints might change, uh, or some characteristic might change. So you should actually follow the instructions and make sure before that it doesn't impact your cluster. Automation is key here. So if you have a thousand node cluster, you don't want to go in there for each node individually. And before you do that, obviously backup. The key thing uh, when doing, at least in a Mesos land, a backup. So for example, this was something I long time really hated about Docker. Whenever I would upgrade to Docker daemon, I had to kill all containers running on that node, which just felt, feels wrong. Uh, I simply want to upgrade the system. I don't want to touch my running containers. So, and also for Twitter, Apple, and all those big companies using Mesos, this is like a no-go. So um, the upgrade procedure for Mesos and DCUS is really focused on that the workloads can keep on running. And the key part to that is actually here. So this is a task running on one of the agent nodes, and they have a little supervisor, which is called executor. And so even when I upgrade the agent, so I'm bringing down the agent process on that node, I replace it with the agent process next version, uh, the executor and the actual task will keep on running. And now when the new agent is up and running, uh, the old executor can actually reconnect to that. So even during that time, my container and my task is available. So if that's a web server, this can keep on serving uh, websites during the upgrade. The only thing which I cannot do while the agent process is down is go in and start or stop other containers. Um, similarly, usually if I do an upgrade, I start with the masters. Um, so I would usually pick a standby master, upgrade that, um, you don't even have to do that manually. This will all happen automatically. You just have to specify which master you want to update. And then I simply see whether it can rejoin the cluster. And then I cycle through all, uh, all master nodes. And then next, I'll, I would do the same uh, with the uh, agent nodes. And as discussed, all the tasks and containers will keep, up, keep on running. Okay. Framework upgrades, so what happens if I upgrade Kafka? What happens if I upgrade my containers themselves? This is orthogonal, and this is what we had on one of the earlier slides, uh, where it's really beneficial to have some kind of advanced deployment technologies. By the way, this is also something where Istio is really helpful in having different rollout strategies, because they control those individual load balances, uh, which in turn control the network. And so this really helps in having canary deployments, blue-green deployments, because you can basically shape the traffic going to individual nodes. So you can, for example, say I have uh, 10 containers. I first replace one, and then I slowly start moving traffic on that a new container to see whether it can actually withstand traffic. Software upgrades. All upgrades uh, in your cluster, they should be controlled by you. So a common problem in the early years, as I said, I really disliked the early Docker updates, uh, but were also updates between the different Docker versions. First of all, it would kill all containers, okay. Uh, the container orchestrator will restart them, and they now also fix that. On the other hand, uh, there were also incompatibilities. So what we often saw in large production clusters is that actually the next Docker version broke some, uh, broke in the production system because it was incompatible to the one before. 
And this is not so much about Docker, but it's about, in general, each dependency you're running in your cluster should be controlled by you. Uh, and you should be able to reproduce any state. And having automatic updates, for example, for this Docker dependency, uh, will usually mess up your cluster. Uh, day two operations. So um, what I find very important is uh, the work for all of us, it doesn't stop once our app is running on the cluster. It starts actually on day two. So day one is when we rolled everything out onto the cluster. And on day two, the maintenance is starting. And there are different challenges. So uh, first of all, and we've seen some of them already, so it's updates. So how can I scale my containers? How can I potentially automatically scale my containers? How can I upgrade to your next version? How can I maintain my cluster? How can I upgrade my cluster? And probably most important is how can I monitor whether everything is okay? And um, then potentially also how can I debug things? So for debugging, um, one thing you should consider, and this is a question whether you need that or whether you want to do this, is whether you want to allow uh, your developers to debug on a production system, for example, or even on your test cluster. What it means if you're running Docker, Docker exec is pretty cool, but Docker exec requires SSH access to the individual nodes. So uh, it actually it means I have to give my developers access to the entire node, and they were also to all nodes running on that container. DCUS does it slightly different. So in DCUS, I have a similar command, but I can actually control that with ACLs, which container uh, you can debug. So you can, for example, say each developer can only debug his or her own containers and not all containers running on the same node. Uh, with monitoring, uh, there are different kinds of metrics. So um, the important questions you should look out for is uh, typically like how utilized is my cluster and how well are my resources used. And this is exactly what we see, discussed before, this uh, resource allocation slack. If I allocate one gigabyte of memory to a container and it constantly own, doesn't use more than 100 megabytes, then I'm wasting 900 plus X megabytes. So I probably should change uh, that resource allocation. Um, also, there are different kinds of metrics I want to keep. So, um, first of all, there are Mesos itself or the container orchestrator itself. It'll have some metrics. Then each of the container will have metrics and each of the applications will also have metrics. And then typically, which I usually already have, is uh, also my agent. So each node in the system will also have some kind of metrics. And the key part is to actually monitor all of those and be able to uh, integrate all of those. So if I have uh, a container failing, it's great to check what were the container metrics, what were the application metrics, what were the metrics of the underlying uh, box of the underlying node where this thing was running. Okay, um, this is now kind of like a production checklist which just has some more points uh, which, for example, are really valuable to uh, look at. So, for example, uh, what you should monitor is that the masters and agents, they are not constantly restarting. And even though this is Mesos checklist, this applies to all systems. Uh, so, um, just to avoid that there's no underlying issue, which, for example, the missiles masters restarting, it might be that the quorum cannot agree up on who's leading. Or it might mean that they have too little memory and hence they're being killed. So this is something you should uh, tightly monitor. And similarly for then your working task, uh, you should check that there's not a high number of tasks being killed or restarted or failing uh, at a single point in time. Some low numbers of them, they are totally normal in any system, but if there are spikes uh, in, your, uh, in this curve, uh, then it's something you should look out for. Uh, we discussed about five masters, and yeah, those masters, place them on different racks so the rack doesn't become uh, the single uh, point of failure. And also, all operator endpoints uh, should be secured. Any operator endpoint where someone can do something stupid, uh, that should be secured. 
So he doesn't hit it by accident. Um, we've seen this. Zookeeper. Zookeeper slash any critical Java application you're running. Uh, and I think we also have that here, yeah, on the next slide. So for any critical Java application you're running, uh, things I would monitor is heap usage. Uh, if that comes close to the limit, then your container will be killed and restarted. And uh, the other thing is garbage collection performance. So uh, usually, like, how long are the pauses in between? And uh, what is the frequency of full collections, which hopefully there are not too many in your system. Um, Zookeeper, you should also secure uh, similar. When I say Zookeeper, you can replace it with Etsy uh, and backup from time to time. And uh, dum 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 dum. Yeah, I think this is the most important thing. Yeah, if you deploy any, you should keep the system quorum. Uh, independent of any application quorum. So many applications actually require their own quorum. So just as an example, if you're deploying Kubernetes on top of Mesos, Kubernetes will bring its own Etsy cluster, uh, each of the instances. So that really helps to keep those different fault domains independent of each other. Okay, we've seen that. And this actually brings us to the last slide, and as we have some minutes left, uh, I usually like to see what are your personal nightmares uh, you've seen so far, uh, what are experiences you might share, want to share with the other people. Anyone? All your clusters are running fine, they're never failing. All right, then thank you very much for listening and feel free to ask questions afterwards. <laughs> 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 <laughs>